B-Bad and Brandon. I can. Perfect. Yes, sweet. You in the garage, bro? Yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, what is happening, my man? Um, not a whole lot. I don't know. I've got a bunch of projects I'm trying to figure out travel for. Um, <laughs> and then I coach high school football. <laughs> wow. Wow. wow, bro, that's crazy. Man, um, introduce ourselves. I'm Johnny. Oh, yeah. The one who reached out and said good day on Facebook to you. Um, All right. My, my good man, Brando, over there, sitting there as well, bro. I completely forgot we actually hadn't met. I was just like, oh, yeah, let's just, let's just, let's just. I was like, oh, yeah, we'll just change to another mate. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we did that 10 out of 11 times. Oh, every time. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, yeah, we built a relationship via Facebook message. Everyone, we're just all mates now. We're fucking tight. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. And afternoon for you on the other side of the world, is that, is that what we got? Um, yeah, it's dark out by now. It's, uh, night is starting. So yeah. nice. Where are you, bro? I'm in Tallahassee, Florida. Oh, nice. Yeah. We're working our way around America with some different people. So always confuses us with time zones. We've got to try and get Google, the Google button to try and work out when we can actually call you guys. Draw yeah. <laughs> you think- Where are y'all at? We're in, uh, uh, Queensland. Brisbane. Brisbane. Yeah, okay. we're within Queensland. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we are on the east. We're east coast of Australia. Yeah, we're east. Yeah. Mm-hmm. West. Yeah, yeah and right. it's like um, 10 30 in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Or Friday. Yeah. We're in the future. Yeah, we're in the future. <laughs> Let you know Friday's pretty good, bro, by the looks of it. We're only a few hours in, but we're a few more hours than you in Friday. So it's pretty nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the weather's good too. Yeah, I went to Australia a couple of years ago. Um, I flew out to Perth. Oh yeah. For a screening out there and uh then just spent like a week in Sydney. Oh. Did you like it over here, bro? Was that your first time? Oh yeah, yeah. It was my first time. Uh it was it was really cool. Yep. It's too very Good food everywhere. You visited as well. Like Perth's drastically different to, to Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> you got to experience um, this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Ruchis brought yep. us out there for a screening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those boys are awesome. Did you go to their gym? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, they, uh, that is I don't know if they're in the same place now. I think they've moved. They either just moved out right after or had just moved in. Yep. I think they would have just moved out. Yeah. Because yeah. that would have been a couple of years ago thanks to old COVID. So even that old, yeah. that was a gym. No, it was more than a gym. I don't know what it was. Yeah, man, it was funny. <laughs> It was ridiculous. Love the Ruchi brothers. The only thing is, like, yellow is such a strong color. <laughs> yeah. A lot of yellow. <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot of yellow. But, bro, mate, um, we should make it official to kick off the thing, make it a, an official kickoff. Um, we normally start with asking you, you the big question of 21 words, who you are and what you do. And mm-hmm. then we'll, we'll count your words and your sounds and your noises, and that will make your 21. So, if you burp or fart, we'll also add that to the 21 words. So be careful. It should just be All right. 21 sounds. 21 sounds. We yeah. can change that. We should. Good pick. 100 and something. This is our time. first podcast, so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I promise. How'd ask. you come to 21? Um, well, it's a nice number. It's, it's two less than my favorite number, which yep. is 23. Okay. Number. Yeah, bro. Why? I'm a burp. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, and Michael Jordan, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's a given. Well, that, that, that's two very good reasons, so... Yeah. And 21 know. seems to really mess with people, too. Yeah, we, we get... A lot of our guests get some full-blown anxiety when we ask them this question. Yeah. You're so far <laughs> handling it really well. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's the delay in the connection or <laughs> it's just because you've, you've done worse, stupider things than <laughs> sit on a podcast with two blokes in Australia, so... Yeah. Yeah, it's probably something, probably something like that. I don't know. I've been, I've been through some shit lately. Um, so well, 21. You ready for the count? I guess. It's on, bro. No pressure. And go. All right. I'm a passionate storyteller. It's five. I really could just leave it fucking there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess everyone listening would have heard that you also coach high school football at the moment as well. Uh, 
the the storyteller. Tell us about that because obviously myself and Johnny know some of the stories that you have been lucky enough to tell. But mm-hmm. how did that begin for you? So you're a producer? I I have a lot of jobs. They're they're largely uh they sound cool and they also sound made up. Um <laughs> Yeah, so I'm a producer, which basically just means I figure out some way to make things happen. Um, It's not really any more glamorous than that, uh, especially because I work in documentaries. Um, So, you know, like the biggest documentary filmmakers of our day are, you know, skinny little dudes like Ken Burns and just kind of slob and fat asses like Michael Moore. So there's... (laughs) you know, it's a, it's an easy kind of lane to slip into. But uh, yeah, when I was, when I was young, uh, I think I just talked a lot. And I, I just always relish like a moment to tell a story. Mm-hmm. And I think through sheer repetition of doing it and having enough audiences of uh, people who just wanted to hear me get to the point and shut up. Um, <laughs> I developed some tricks and got some sort of a sense for it sweet and um what was the first story you told bro what did you where did it all start for you um the first story i told was probably of you know some just dumbass kid doing something in class to my mom (laughs) (laughs) and really everything has just sort of evolved from that i mean most of the stories that i tell most of when i was in school I had to write a lot of scripts and stuff and most of them would be adaptations of something dumb that someone I knew did. Yep. Man, that's sick. And like, obviously it started to grow into what we know as like you've worked on one of our, if not the most important documentary of our time. Exactly right. (laughs) Being the (laughs) Barbell documentary. How'd you get involved in that, man? Um, So I grew up in a, in a weird in a weird house. I have a father who is very intense and sort of obsessive. Um, and he, he grew up like a poor kid in a rich suburb of Chicago. And for him, sports were sort of the great equalizer. And one of the, one of the kids that he grew up with got him interested in, um, weightlifting, um, for a a young kid with a massive chip on his shoulder, the idea that he could kind of, you know, narrow that gap between uh, the people who lived around him, because he, he literally grew up in a shack in a, in a neighborhood of, of all, you know, rich kids and millionaires. Oof, and he grew up, you know, son of Irish immigrant parents who had nothing. And, you know, your neighbor's riding to, riding to school in a Rolls Royce, and you have to walk because your family, no one in your family has ever owned a car. Yeah. Um, So he became obsessive about lifting weights and uh, he got a little bit of money eventually. And uh, somehow he went this sort of standard, you know, path that most Americans, at least at the time in the late seventies through the eighties went, which was, he got into bodybuilding, Mm -hmm. realized that he wasn't, you know, any good at that. Uh, Just no, no natural predisposition for it. And um, at some point, he, he hurt his back. He had had a series of back problems. And at some point, he read in a, in a bodybuilding magazine about the reverse hyper. Oh, wow. wow. This is early 90s, maybe 93, 94. Um, Louis had literally just started selling them. So he didn't know about powerlifting, didn't know, you know about any of it. But uh, he just heard someone or you know, rather read one sentence where someone said this miracle machine fixed my back and my dad went on a tear to try and find one. So he ended up getting a year long subscription to powerlifting USA solely so that he could cut out, this is like 93. Yeah. So solely so that he could cut out the little, you know, order form in the back of the magazine to mail it off to get one of these machines. He had never seen it. He didn't know anything about it other than some little tiny tidbit of 
some bodybuilder who he probably also knew nothing about <laughs> who just happened to say like oh i went to this weird place and they had this thing it fixed my back reverse hyper power lifter and from there um he got the reverse hyper assembled it it came with a tape he popped the tape in there was a little weird nasal troll man <laughs> that shit's that shit's strange he threw the tape away i'd be mad about that later and uh but he still every month was getting the powerlifting usas yep and so uh he was princeton educated and stuff pretty smart guy pretty inquisitive so he starts reading these magazines that are still coming and, you know he had bodybuilding magazines before that and i've never been much for bodybuilding but uh from what i've seen the magazines i mean like, like how many different ways can you say like keep doing reps yeah. so he gets <laughs> powerlifting usa and it's you know it's a little different take on things and the guys look a little more like him yep. um barrel chested and you know short limbs and uh hairy uh, not <laughs> hairy. Yes. You know, hey, man. pale not, not hey, greased man. up so uh he's looking at those and you know it's you know oh it's it's captain kirk's workout it's yeah. it's ed Cohn's workout it's and again it's you know instead of how many different ways can you say keep doing reps it's how many how many different ways can you you know say linear periodization just yeah. 12 week, eight week, 16 week, you know, just a number of weeks, intensity goes up, volume comes down. It, yep. you know, that part got boring. And then you had these weird articles from Louie. Yeah. And he didn't know it at first that Louie was the same guy whose tape he had thrown away with really? reverse hyper. <laughs> but after a while, he starts reading it. And, you know, the idea of breaking strength down into, you know, really into special strengths and the talking about it in terms of the physics of it and, you know, some, some simple biological concepts. Suddenly that stuck out to him and he just wanted to know, to know more. So he ended up buying every tape that Louis had available at the time. Um, the, I think by then there was, or at least shortly after there was a book of methods um, that's been updated a couple times by now. Um, but he became just obsessed with it. And every day I'd come home from school and he'd be watching West Side tapes and yes. telling me things about all the characters. And then when I was 12, um, I started throwing shot put and discus. I made it to AAU track and field nationals. Yeah. Happened to be in Cleveland. Um, and my dad, who doesn't travel much, he's uh, pretty much a recluse. Uh, he said, well, we're, you know, you're going to Cleveland for this track meet. Cleveland's in Ohio. Yes. That means West Side must be just around the corner. <laughs> so he, you know, quote chaperoned <laughs> so that uh, he could go to West Side. <laughs> yeah, he could get up there immediately, rented a car, and then everyone else went to the track. And he said, you know, Michael, come here. We're hopping in a car. We're going to a gym. I assumed it'd be like a Gold's, yep. you know, like a standard Globo gym. And uh, I'd seen those before, though we had a squat rack and a bench and at this point a reverse hyper in our house um what a setup <laughs> yeah and uh i get to west side and the first thing i see is chuck vogelpool oh. who was injured at the time sitting on a bench yes. uh dave tate came over to say hi to us mm -hmm. louie was in the bathroom and uh they're doing like speed squats yep. and my dad, like he sees Chuck and he's, he's all excited. You know, this is like one of his idols at the time. So he just kind of pushes me towards Chuck and Chuck literally like growled at me, <laughs> um, you know, cause I'm a 12 year old kid. And this is, this is the hardcore strip mall version of West side. This is the blacked out windows. And oh, that's this one. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, uh, and then Louie comes bouncing out of the bathroom and he's, you know, they're about to do speed squats. He's got uh, some briefs on and he might've had, you know, suit, uh, a suit with the, the straps pulled down. Yep. But uh, Louie walks over and we're about the same height. And I watch this, you know, strange man approach me. And my dad again pushes me forward and goes, <laughs> Louie, this is my son. And as he's saying that, Louie's walking out of the bathroom and he's aggressively like itching his balls. <laughs> and 
<laughs> just shoveling uh what is it the i always fucking forget the name of it when i try and tell the story um I think it's like Ben Gay or something. It's anti-itch powder. He's, yeah. he's just shoveling it down there and complaining about how something doesn't feel right down there. And then my dad pushes me forward. He kind of scoops my elbow up from behind, forcing my hand up. And Louie <laughs> leans in and shakes my hand with that same hand that had just come from That's the That's Ben Avery's balls. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was completely disgusted and had no idea where I was. And... Uh, from that trip, we ended up going a couple times, a couple days back to West Side. Mm-hmm. And my dad asked Louie, like, would you ever come down to Florida and do a seminar? Yep. And Louie, of course, said no. He didn't like to travel. You know, his gym is where he needs to be. Yep. Uh, and again, this is, you know, this is pre sort of internet and stuff. So this is just like, hey, man, I got 600 square feet and it's all disgusting and it smells funny. And I've got these, you know, bizarre dudes in it. But this is where I have to be. Yep. And he's turning down money. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dave Tate pokes his head out and he had just started a lead FTS. He was starting to handle some seminars. So Dave said, you know, well, fuck it, I'll do it. I'll come down. Oh, wow. So the following summer, Dave Tate came down to our house, really? to our gym <laughs> to do a seminar. And, in uh, huh? In your house gym, in your garage, he did the seminar. Yeah, he didn't know it was a garage. He, <laughs> he thought, you know, he goes, do you have a gym? And my dad's like, oh, yeah, we got a gym, you know, like. And by this point in time, a year later, my dad had bought a monolift. Yep. And we got a belt squat. Yep. Um, and garage, like, oh, yeah, we had by this point in time, we probably had a, a giant cambered bar and we had a buffalo bar. And, you know, I think we had at least one safety squat bar, if not three. <laughs> um, you know we had bands we had chains yep. i mean like he went full bore into into it yep. and dave comes out we pick him up at the tallahassee you know regional airport there out in the middle of the forest yep. and we, he you know my dad drives him to the other side of town and dave had been selling you know spots to come to the seminar and we had a guy from australia who had left who had come up he left his family at Disney because just like us, he thought, well, fuck, it's Florida. You know, Tallahassee, Florida, Orlando, Florida. I'm sure they're right around the corner from each other. <laughs> but they were like four hours apart. So uh, they all came out and they piled in. You know, Dave finally saw the place and was like, you know, oh, shit, what have I done? <laughs> I'm going to ruin my reputation. You know, this guy's insane. Yep. And uh Ended up having, I think, like 12 people or something for a two-day seminar. Yep. They ate a bunch of barbecue. Yep. Uh, there was no AC, and there was just torrential rain, and there's really bad mosquitoes here in Florida. So because the, you know it got so hot, they had to put the, the door up, but when you put the door up, rain was coming in sideways, and mosquitoes were pouring in. So just all day, the door is going down and then coming back up and going back down. But after a couple of days, you know, Dave said like, this was actually all right. Like, you know, let me know if you ever want to do another one. My dad goes, sure, next year, like, come on back. Get in. And then, uh, so we, they did 2000, 2001, and I think 2003 or 2004. Yep. Um, and Dave did all three of them. Yep. But from there, so I had like met these guys before they really got like big on the internet. And my dad kept in constant contact with them. So, uh, and in my house, like we had the bears, we had the bulls and we had West side. Like they were, a, they might as well have been a pro team for us. You know, yep. Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen, Chuck Vogelpohl and Louis Simmons, you know, like that was, that was every it. day in our house. That's fucking amazing. And I know there's just like a, what young, a way to grow up. I know. <laughs> That's unreal. Yeah. Like there's just a younger generation of listeners coming through who have no idea who are those those guys are. Who are those names? Yeah. What they do? It's like you go. And go I'm lucky to them. I know. <laughs> do some fucking research. <laughs> like, yeah. So how old are you now? Sorry, Michael. Um, I'm 34. Yep. Fucking hell. Damn, bro. And so did you did you start training a bit of Westside stuff around that age as well? Having access to all that stuff with your dad pushing you as well. 
Yeah, um, I played I played football in high school, yeah. American football, and um, my freshman year I couldn't touch the field. Oh. I played JV. Uh, I literally did not get in for a snap as a JV football player. We had a uh, we had one game that was canceled because of nine eleven, and we had a makeup like freshman only scrimmage. Yeah. against another school and I got in for four plays yeah. um, in those four plays I had a tackle and an onside kick recovery uh, so I did all right but what had happened was a kid had uh, a kid broke a clip on his on his helmet so his chin strap wouldn't clip so the refs made him come out and before they could figure out who to put in I just sprinted out because I was like this is our last fucking game it's like late in the third quarter these coaches are never going to play me. So I just ran out there and it took them four plays until they could figure out, you know, who they wanted to put in. And they yanked me out and said, you're never playing again. And I was like, cool. Season's done anyways. <laughs> um, but so then the season ended and my dad thought I was going to quit. And instead I said, you know, like I, re you know, I was like, it really pissed me off that I couldn't get on the field. What can we do? And he was like, oh, my God, I've been waiting for this moment. Like, <laughs> finally here, uh, you know, come into the garage, you know, like, come come see all this. By then, we had two, mo or at one point, we had two modelers. Um, in a garage. Yeah, in a garage. It was There's no a, cars anymore. <laughs> no, there had never, there, I don't even remember cars being in it. It's been that long, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, this garage. Huh? How big was the garage? Um, about the same size as the one I'm sitting in right now, a, a two car garage. Um, that's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. It was the kind of thing where you had to move like on upper body day, we'd have to move stuff so that we could bench and then we'd move it back so that we could squat on lower body days. Yep. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was benching, um, I went over this uh, like last year with my dad when I started coaching high school football because I'm coaching at the same high school that I went to. I oh. moved back to my like hometown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I benched 112.5 pounds because we had one and a quarters. Yep. And I squatted 87 and a half pounds. Oh, yeah. And by the time I graduated, I was a three year varsity starter. I started week one of my sophomore year. Yep. The coaches thought that I was a transfer student. Um, <laughs> they didn't realize who you were. <laughs> yeah, because no one had ever seen me on the field. And then I showed up and I hadn't grown any taller. Like I was, I was about 6'1", six, 6'1 one, six, one and a half as a freshman and about 155, 160 pounds. Yeah, that's like and then as a sophomore, I'm the same height, but I was about 180. Yeah. So it wasn't even like I got real, you know, real big, but... Uh, I went from, you know, running probably like a five, six, 40 to a four, eight. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I got pretty fast, uh, a ton of just at, back then we called them calf ham glute somewhere along the way they, they changed to glute ham. Yep. Um, but, uh, I was, I was, you know, I could just reel off those all day long, literally while talking to people. Yep. Um, but I started to get fast. I started to get strong. By the time I was a senior, I was 245 pounds, still running a four, eight, um, jumping 31 inches. And, uh, by then my squat to a 12 inch box was in the upper four oh, hundreds nice. and my bench was three seventy. Um, so, just, so sorry, just with the pound conversions for those listening here in Oz, you went from 165, which is about 75 kilos, to 240. That's, uh -huh. a, that's, that's a 110. One te you're a 110 by then. Holy mm -hmm. fuck. Yeah, bro. Yeah. And but I, I was faster at that weight than I was yeah, when geez. I was lighter. Wow. Turns out lifting weights works, eh? <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty well. <laughs> what was that experience for you um, in the garage with your dad when you've, you've asked for some help and he's obviously thought, fucking, this is the best. And then training with him for a period of time like that. Um, it was it was awesome. I mean, um, you know, I would later go on to uh, 
when I was a senior, I had a few offers to, to play college football. Um, none of them were where I'm from in Florida. Like I had a kid who trained with me. He went to Clemson. Clemson's the same team that battles with Alabama every year for the national championship here. Um, I had two teammates who went to Clemson. We had kids all over town who were going to very, very big schools. So I got offered to um, what are now called like FCS schools, uh, some Ivy Leagues. Um, I, I had one school, Wisconsin, was uh, willing to give me a gray shirt, which basically meant that like they would take me the following year and I would have to do one semester post prep. Yeah. Um, but at the time, the, the area that I was in was so like stacked full of talent that I was honestly like really embarrassed of these kind of offers. Yeah. And I thought like, well, I'm not even playing, you know, big time football. I'm going to go do this other thing that I'm really into, which is film. Yeah. Wow. And no one would let you do both. Yep. However, I would not have been able to ever do film if it weren't for like the confidence that I got from doing, you know, from becoming like pretty good at football. Mm -hmm. And I would never have become any good at football or become confident at all had it not been for the weight room. Yep. Um, and that really like, you know, like I, I saw that like, oh, I go and, you know, sweat and, you know, toil in the garage for a couple hours a day for a few months. And all of a sudden, you know, I went from not being able to touch the football field to my first week on varsity Yep. They switched me to tight end. I'd never played it before. And I was the leading receiver our first game. Wow. No one had ever thrown me a pass. <laughs> oh, fuck. Spoiler, like I didn't have good hands. Like yep. I could catch well. So yep. that game, I got lucky and I caught everything. Fuck. That wasn't, that wasn't the regular occurrence as it turned out. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but like all of a sudden I was on, you know, websites for football recruiting i mean like it was it was instantaneous it was That's funny. on friday no one had ever heard of me yep. and on saturday i was on the front page of the sports section oh, fuck. like the article recapping the game starts and you know like starts with me as the highlight wow i was on the news and suddenly like just random dudes in the grocery store like grown-ass men were like you know, hey, are you that Fahey kid? You know, where are you thinking of going to school? And I'm like, I, I sucked at this until literally yesterday. So I don't, I don't know. But it was all of a sudden, like it gave, you know, like I, I recognized how people started to look at me different. Um, like I was, I was a relatively like shy, quiet kid. And now I can go anywhere and talk to anyone I hold many a podcast record for longest episode because I fucking will talk. But uh, none of that. And that all ended up like suiting me really well once I got into a more artistic field because like I don't really look the part. Like I'm a lumbering giant and I, you know, dress like a former athlete and stuff. Like I don't, I don't fit in at film events and parties. You know, I don't look like a skinny little hipster. <laughs> Um, but I kind of like, I very easily scare the shit out of everyone. And that kind of becomes like my in and my sort of defining feature in those environments is, you know, I become this oddity and this talking point because I'm this former athlete. Yep. Um, but it, none of that would have been possible if I had not seen, you know, like the beauty of lifting that you you lift today. Like if we started a workout right now, we went and did speed squats. We would be wrecked in about two hours. Yeah. Like, and for the next three days, we'd be weaker for having done it. And then we would be a little stronger, but not strong enough that you could measure. Like you just have to trust it. Yeah. And like, you have to repeat this cycle over and over again. And I see it all the time now with the kids that I coach. Um, cause I'm the strength coach. I, I, you know, help out on the football side, but the weight room is mine. Yep. And I see it all the time where like I, and I use West side with the kids, like we max twice a week and I track all their numbers and I come in with a big ass spreadsheet that I've printed out for the day. And I'm telling them, you know, 
hey, you, you know, you squatted, we use a lot of safety squat bars uh, that are 61 pounds. So, you know, it's, hey, man, you squatted 466 last week. Let's try and hit 460, you know, let's try and hit 471. Yep. And they can't, you know, to them, like that five pound increase, the same kid literally can't remember that six months ago he was squatting 200 pounds. Yeah. And I have a kid who did that, who's no gone up 266 pounds in Holy about shit. seven months. That's um, <laughs> yeah, I have other kids who've gone up like 14 inches on their vertical in a year. Oh. Um, yeah, turns out the shit still works, still works for, <laughs> for young people really, really well. Um, but like at that age, you don't, you know, like a week seems like a long time. Yeah. So if a kid doesn't, it, you know, like doesn't improve by a, a perceptible amount in a week, they feel like they've failed. Mm -hmm. But as an adult, like looking at them, you know, you're like, if you didn't, if you missed that kid last week, he's gone up, you know, four inches on his vertical or his 40 went down two tenths or, you know, like we're watching these kids turn into completely different people. Mm -hmm. But because of the way that kids perceive time, you know, like they, if they didn't experience a huge PR today, yeah. they feel like they haven't done anything in months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, do you find it's, it's obviously you're in it now with mm -hmm. this generation, but did you find that when you were going through it yourself and like training with your old man, did you have a similar mentality? Did you find <laughs> that you weren't? progressing week to week that it was different or do you think this generation almost expects that that progress week to week um i i think what happened was eventually um my dad brought in this other kid who lived in our neighborhood who happened to be naturally like pretty strong he was he wasn't a good athlete um, but he was really, really strong naturally. I mean, he squatted, this kid squatted 600 to a 12 inch box at 15 and 190 pounds. Fuck um, me. yeah, but he started when I was squatting, like, you know, 180, he was probably squatting like three, you know, 350. Like he just started at a really high point was naturally super strong. He was also way shorter than me. Again, I'm, I'm about six, two and a half, six, three. And way. this kid was like five, <laughs> five. Um, but he was just kicking my ass. And again, I was really, I wasn't, I was kind of soft. I wasn't tough. Um, at least not at that point, but I really hated like losing and especially losing in an embarrassing fashion. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've always just been like really relentlessly kind of detail oriented and stuff. So if he beat me by 120 pounds and the next week he beat me by 115, yeah, that was a win for me. Yeah, you know, yeah. like I was, I was going, okay, you know, like one of these days I'm going to beat your ass. Like it's, you know, and I would think about it, like, you know, it's going to take this many weeks at this pace. And then some weeks I'd have a good week and I might shorten that by, you know, 15 or 20 pounds at a time. And eventually like I started out benching him I never got more than maybe a hundred pounds away from him on the squat. Um, I could out deadlift him simply because he had tiny little sausage fingers. Um, <laughs> you know, like it was really cheap and petty, but I was like, I'll take it, you know, any way that I could beat this kid. And along the way, like he got basically stronger than my dad in certain lifts. And so suddenly I was competing with my dad and then other kids started to fold in. And as those other kids came in, um, eventually I was at such a higher and higher point as they started that it got to the point where kids would tell me like, I didn't know what it was like because I had always been strong. And I was just like, no motherfucker, like you don't remember, you know, you weren't here eight months ago when I was the weakest person in the building. <laughs> yeah. um, and then it got to a point where like, I wanted to, once I felt that I was stronger than almost everyone, then I started to get really confident. Mm. And then I wanted to not just be stronger than everyone. I wanted it to be 
you know, noticeable and visible. And I never wanted anyone to get the impression that they could challenge me. Mm. So then I didn't want to have any bad days. And I would, you know, I'd have nosebleeds, I'd pass out under the bar. Um, I would, I would go to a really foolish and stupid place uh, if it meant that I could edge somebody out. Yes. And now, yeah, I don't see a whole lot of kids who are like that. Yeah. Um, I do see, like I said, the kid who put like 260 pounds on a squat, 266 to be exact. He is aware of what every single other person in the gym does. Mm -hmm. Like he, and he, you know, he's quiet and he's a freshman and, you know, he's, he's not good on the field, mm -hmm. but he, you know, he's becoming a lot better simply because he gives such high effort. So, uh, you know, that's one of the, also the beautiful things is like, if you just coast in the weight room, you don't make a lot of progress. Mm. You give a lot of effort. Um, you get the adaptations. And I try and explain to the kids like practice works the same way. Mm. Like, you know, if you're just jogging through something like you don't get that adaptation because it's not representative of anything you're going to see at game speed. Mm -hmm. So in order to learn how to do something new at game speed, you have to be at game speed, you know, mm -hmm. in order to get the, F the stimulus from max effort, you have to be mm -hmm. at max effort. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do see that the kids, a lot of them, we do enough stuff that and rotate enough that, you know, they, a lot of them find something that they're good at and they'll compete in that. Yeah. And it's always kind of a struggle to get them to compete in, you know, if a kid can jump really well, he'll compete in the jumps yeah. until he beats everyone. Then you like need another kid to beat him because yeah. he'll start to take it, you know, he'll start to take off. And if he has a bad day, he'll not want to do anything else. So you need another kid that's going to not only beat him, but like rub it in all day. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with that that healthy competition like i think it creates a lot of character and builds a lot of character but yeah we get lost in you know this generation that they want it now everyone everyone wants it now but everyone gets like something for participating yeah. and we've spoken a lot before in our podcast and i just i just kind of get around you know particip participation medal for everyone but the idea of healthy competition like i'm sure there is a better way like you reference how you gave yourself nosebleeds and fucking went to that you know those places and like we're not one to fucking argue with that like i had mm. butted a barbell last week till i was fucking bleeding from my forehead was it necessary at yes. the time yes it was but is yes. there a better way 100 no, percent. but it i don't yeah <laughs> supposedly like, i just don't think kids or, or, and i say kids but I mean, I mean adolescents and everyone like that they just don't appreciate the grit that comes from having to be challenged day in day out in a fucking gym mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. especially like you mentioned some of the fucking vikings of this industry and chuck vogel dave tate louis simmons like those motherfuckers are the savages mm -hmm. like proper mm -hmm. savages <clears throat> like i can't imagine you know i there's a part of me that definitely envies you because growing up in around that environment obviously your old man uh, really took it on board as well. Like, can you imagine the savagery, the confidence you mentioned that you would just go through life it, having, being around just men of that caliber? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you've just referenced Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan, Chuck Vogel, Dave Tate, Louis Simmons. Like, fuck, <laughs> if you just want to be an athlete or good at anything, just go look at what those guys did and replicate that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the thing that happens with kids nowadays, I'm not real big on just like bashing kids because ultimately it's, you know, like if the kids are fucked up, it's, mm. it's like our fault. Yeah. You know, like, um, and I've had, you know, I, I had an incident, I had an incident that out of just courtesy, I won't get into, but I had, <laughs> I had something that happened just the other day where a parent over something that was on social media, mm -hmm. a parent demanded that I put up videos of their son doing some sort of physical feat. Now the spoiler is their son doesn't train with me. 
he doesn't train with our team. Um, and this parent went, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. Like I, you know, I do podcasts and I, I talk to coaches at, you know, the high school and a, a lot at the college level um, here in the U S and I know coaches from around the world because of making the movie. And, uh, a lot of, you know, like I go to say Florida state, for example, and coach storms over there, the, the strength and conditioning coach, like we've talked before, you know, he seen my movie. He knew who I was when I, when I, you know, went to talk to him, but then I go to this high school and most of the kids, you know, haven't seen my movie or don't know that I ever made a movie, you know, almost none of the parents know anything about the movie, anything about me, anything about West side. Uh, and I'll have parents come up to me, you know, saying how, well, we want our kid to get, you know, this better training experience. So we went to the local gym and hired him a personal trainer. <laughs> and I've had, I've had multiple instances where that personal trainer through completely other circumstance will like run into me around town and wants to talk to me about training and he says hey can you come on over to my gym can you and you know i'm working with some kids this afternoon do you want to come by <laughs> and i'm like man this is the this dude wants me to come you know like put on an impromptu seminar in his gym and meanwhile this kid that i you know who's on my team who i train i train this team for free and the you know a parent will take them out because they see free as must be worthless must be meaningless yeah, yeah, yeah. so i had a kid you know his parent says to me you know like uh no i want him to have a, a real trainer a real one oh, yeah. and <laughs> i'm like you know i've got four kids who you know he says he needs he needs a speed he needs a speed coach and someone to help him jump and I'm going, we have 17 players who have jumped 36 inches. We have four who have jumped over 40. <laughs> uh, I don't know the, I should have looked up the conversion so that I could brag more efficiently, yes. but, uh, or effectively. I think we'll, uh, in, in this instance, 36 inches is, would be we, three subway lengths. Three so subways. We, so subway, if you think, you know, they're a 12 inch foot long. So yeah, three subways. Three subways is probably a good way to picture it for us over here. That's a long way. Yeah. <laughs> That's a or, long way, actually. <laughs> yeah. Or to put it this way, at the NBA Combine last year, they had their highest jump was 37.5 inches. Oh, shit. I have about 15 kids who jump higher than that. Their average age is 15.5 years old. Wow. I have. Uh, I have five, so or excuse me, I have six sophomores right now who run in the four five range electric 40s. Yeah. Our freshman 40 record, which is our team 40 record, is a 4.309 electric. <laughs> so, and that kid didn't, he wasn't doing that before I got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, I a lot of these other four five kids were five flat and four nine kids. Yeah. How does someone like yourself, if you're like, and again, you said you're doing this for free, how do you build credibility? Like, is, is there something that you go in and intentionally be like, well, this is what I did. This is how I got to where I was. Or how, how are you creating buy-in for these other parents who are happy to leave their kids in your hands? Um, it's hard because I don't see the parents for the most part. Um, I have a few parents who have kind of gone, you know, I have a few parents who they heard that there was a new coach. They made it a point to come see me and talk to me. Mm. Um, if a parent ever asks for my phone number or ever asks, you know, anything, I will tell them. If a parent ever gets within like speaking distance, if they're ever sort of just within my general orbit, mm. I will go out of my way to, you know, not only introduce myself, but to say, you know, Hey, your kids, you know, like, uh, you're, you know, you're John's mom, right? Mm. You know, uh, we've, here's the improvements we've seen with him. Here's, here's what we've been doing with him, you know, and normally they say, you know, like, oh yeah, he's, he's told us a lot about you. 
you know, they all say like, you're very intense and you talk a lot and <laughs> you say things that the kids, they don't always understand, but you know, like you talk to them a lot and I'm trying to always like explain to them, hopefully in a mean, in a means that they understand yeah. why what we're doing works. Yeah. And then I track everything that they do. Uh, Cause I know that they'll forget you know, I've seen a kid, I've seen a kid celebrate, you know, hitting the same PR, you know, like two months in a row. And the second time I have to tell him like, Hey, you hit that last time. <laughs> and I go, Oh, really? I did. You know, like, and, and suddenly they'll find another 10 pounds and go, you know, like, go again. <laughs> that's a, that's a PR now. Right. And go, yeah. And they go, okay. Okay. <laughs> Write that down, please. Like we're good now. <laughs> um, but, uh, at the high school that I'm at last year, the first day that I got there, we had eight players doing our off season workouts. Mm. Um, and we had all of last spring, we had 40, uh, 40 kids participate between every workout. Wow. Yeah. And then uh, this off season, we've had 93 kids participate. Wow. Holy shit. And we had a high water mark for one day of 46. Wow. So that, you know, that's the ultimate like marker for me is yeah. if the kids are showing up, then, you know, that's it. a good, good indicator of, of the buy-in. Yeah. Um, but on top of that, like they, they're now to the point where like they'll request, you know, certain exercises and stuff, or they'll come in asking like, Hey, we're not going to, you know, you're not going to make us do flying tens again. Are you? <laughs> so, well, it's a Tuesday, so maybe not, you know, it's an upper body day, but yeah. tomorrow, 100%, like bring your cleats. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Lasers will be out and we'll be, we'll be measuring that. Um, but I try and relate everything to, you know, what attribute are we trying to do or why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. We're doing this because you need more hamstrings. We're doing, you know, we do this jumping every day because we're trying to increase your rate of force development. Mm -hmm. We max, you know, they all know that like we max out because we're trying to, you know, maximize the creation of motor units. Mm. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. And so my next question is, why do you do it for free? Because I really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I really like it. And uh, if I charged, um, it's a public school in Florida. Simply, they wouldn't be able to, afford to pay me anything that was, you know, really worth much um, because of movies and stuff. Like I do, you know, I get a check from Amazon right now, every three months, I get a check from iTunes every three months. I like, I get a check in the mail and then I have other projects that I, you know, work on most mornings for some clients and stuff. So right now, just, I'm at a point where, I'm making decent money uh, and I can afford to budget a big chunk of time in the afternoon to do this thing that Man, uh, be an is really cool. And I can, uh, that way I can serve too, like the kids who otherwise, you know, most of, like most of my best athletes wouldn't be able to afford, yeah, true. you know, a trainer or going to a speed school or something. So if I can give the entire team that the team was also terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, they've been really bad the last few years. And again, it's like, I moved back home. It's my alma mater. Yeah. So like, I want, I want to see them be good. And I believe that they could be yep. if they were given, you know, if they just had a few years of, of good physical development, I think that they could beat the shit out of anybody. Yeah, that's, that's fucking. That's awesome, going to be man. a very proud coach, former student moment when they start kicking some serious ass on that field too. I bet. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully that comes soon. <laughs> so, man, doubling yeah. back. Yeah. Did Louis and did Louis approach you about the documentary? Did you approach Louis? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, approach anyone? So, <laughs> I was gonna say. Yeah, Louis. Louis doesn't. Louis was uh, hostile the entire time. Like uh, <laughs> Louis was. Louis would tell me like every you know every time I showed up and stuff. Like he was always kind to me. Yep. Um, but uh, it was very. Ever you know like 
he let it be known like this wasn't his idea you know in the beginning of the movie there's a disclaimer that says none of this was louis idea uh, and that is there because louis made me put that there that was <laughs> yeah, his his only rules were he would not accept any money which i was like great i don't have any money like i was i was poor yeah. so I was like, cool, I don't have any money. So I, I was going to try and, you know, do this without paying you anyways. Um, and uh, he wanted it to be known that it wasn't his idea. So basically, I had worked on some other documentaries. And um, my dad uh, would just kind of always say, like, you know, what would be a good documentary? West Side. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was like, yeah, but they wouldn't do it. So what does it matter? And then one day he called Louie and he set up a, a meeting between me and Louie. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And he called me in the middle of the night and said like, hey, you got a call with Louie tomorrow. Yep. I said, when? And I was living in LA at the time. So it was three time zones, you know, back. <laughs> and my dad's calling me around midnight my time. Um, Cause he, much like Louie would be up in the middle of the night. <laughs> And so he calls me because he figures I'm the only person who knows who's awake. Yep. And he says, you know, hey, I talked to Louie earlier today. I set up a meeting for you. I go, when? And he goes, 9 a.m. I said, my time or his time? And he goes, oh. And he's mm -hmm. like, I guess his time. I just go, Jesus, dad, like, really? Like, that's in five hours. Fuck, I was so. like, well, what are we talking about? And he's like, you doing a documentary on him? Of course. And I was like, <laughs> I'm working on another documentary right now. I don't have time to even do this. Yep. And he goes, well, you gotta, you're going to have to explain that to Louie then. <laughs> and so, so I, well, shit, like I would really like to do this. I knew enough of the story that, you know, Louie was, even when you don't really know Louie, like Louie's a fascinating character. Um, but so then, of course, 9 a.m., which was 6 a.m. my time, Louis calls and you know pick up the phone and say hello and he goes Louis Simmons <laughs> and I, I I start to say hey Louis and he goes so I heard you want to make a movie about me and before I could say like yeah actually I wanted to talk to you he goes well let me stop you there no <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like all right I literally haven't slept since you know, the night before, because I got told that I had to pitch a movie to you. And now you opened the conversation by saying no. <laughs> Fuck, like, why did I stay up all night? Yep. Um, but he ends up, he, he then he, you know, goes on to say, well, you know, but what would you want to do? And he starts kind of probing to see, like, what did I know? Yep. And he asked me, you know, one of the first things he asked me is, well, how big are you? And I ah. said, well, I'm, I'm about 210 pounds. Yep. And he goes, and how tall are you? And I said, uh, like 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, and he goes, no, no, no. You need to be at least 275. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I laughed and was just like, Lou, I don't, because that's the other part of it is my dad never done a powerlifting meet in his life. Yep. Me, never done a powerlifting meet. Yep. My dad just trained that way because the idea of being strong was good enough. Yep. I trained that way for sports yep. and then I had stopped training for like 10 years. Yep. So now I'm like 27 talking to Louie and he's telling me I need to be 280. Yep. And I was like 210, <clears throat> probably lying to him. I was probably more like two, you know, 200, 205. And he's telling me, you know, you need to be 275. You need to fill out. Those are terrible leverages. And we we get, get to talking and you know what do you know about west side and i start telling him and i'm like well you know i grew up doing a four-day west side kind of split we you know we did tons of sled work i did reverse hypers five six times a week i literally had one in my house one of your first ones the old model with the like where it damn near dislocates your shoulders because the handle is so way down and it's yep. real uncomfortable and he laughed and like, oh, yeah i remember those and <laughs> Uh, I said, you know, like, you know, I, I grew up, you know, I knew about max effort method, dynamic effort method, repetition method, isometrics. I'm telling him just all the things that I could remember, all the things that, you know, we did. And I'm 
telling him how like, you know, the workouts are spaced out 72 hours so that you can recover properly. Max effort's more important than speed workout, you know, than speed work. If you could do max effort every day, like the Bulgarians, then you would, but we all inevitably break. So you can't, so you don't like, I'm trying to explain to him that like, I know this stuff a little bit and, uh, and he, uh, we end up talking for like an hour and then he tells me no again and says, but I'm going to send you some stuff. And he puts me on the phone with his assistant at the time. And she asks for my address. And then I think like, okay, that's it. You know, he told me no, like six times, this will never happen. Um, I'm going to get, you know, I went back to sleep and then I had to, you know, get up and go to another shoot on another movie, um, that I think ended up like the funding fell apart for it. It's a very common thing in, in film is that just things go awry. And, uh, a few days later, I, you know, the doorbell rings and it's like an 8 a.m. early delivery. Wow. And I go to answer it and the guy hands me this big ass box and it's kind of heavy. I put it down, I open it up and it's all West side shirts. No way. It's like 12 West side shirts, uh, his jump manual, the, um, special strengths book. Actually, no, I don't think that one was, that one might've been out that either had just come out or he gave it to me later, but the book of methods, the bench manual, a few DVDs. It was just like everything they had on hand. Mm. And were the shirts all the size up because that's how big he wanted you to be as well. They were all, uh, so I wore large at the time. They were all double X. (laughs) (laughs) True story. They were all double X. And, uh, uh, but so I look at it and I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Like Louis Simmons sent me West side shirts. That's awesome. I, you know, it's got to be like 200 bucks worth of shirts and I didn't pay for any of it. Yep. And then I was like, he got this, the mail came a second time to our house that day. It was the regular like delivery in the afternoon. So I was like, he paid extra to have this shipped to me just a couple hours early. Mm. Wow. And I was like, and he stuffed all these books in it. Yep. So I read every book like, at least twice i watched the dvd probably three times over um or it was a set of dvds but i watched them all just on loop for you know a week and took notes and stuff and i watched a bunch of stuff on youtube and tried to find other interviews and any you know i just started consuming west side media and i called him back a few weeks later and we talked for an hour and a half and then he said no but he said, but call me back in a couple of weeks. I want to know how your training's going. Oh. And so I had, uh, you know, after our first talk, I'd gone back to the gym. I had maxed out on my squat. Uh, I missed 245, 245 pounds to an 18 inch box. Fucking pathetic. <laughs> um, and I missed uh, 215 on a bench press, 215 pounds. Uh, again, coming from where I had been 10 years earlier as a high schooler, I was like, man, like I lost all of it. Mm. Um, But so I just kept training and it by about August of that year, every two weeks, me and Louie had talked and it got to the point where we were talking for like three and a half hours one night. Wow. And I finally had to go and Louie asked, well, when am I going to talk to you again? And he said, I can kind of see how we could do this. And I said, well, you know what? Fuck it, Louie. Like, here's the whole deal. Here's my whole game. I keep talking to you. And I said, my job is that I talk to people who are reluctant to be on camera. And I somehow convince them that they trust me enough to put them on camera. Yeah. He said, I'm going to do the same thing to you. I'm going to catch you on a day where you're feeling kind of good. And I'm going to bait you into saying yes you're probably going to feel bad about it later, but I'm not going to let you out of it. And I'm going to pressure you into eventually getting on camera. You're going to hate it. You're going to say something you don't like. You're going to get mad. You're going to tell me that we have this problem or whatever it is. And I'm going to solve that problem. Yep. And we're going to keep doing this until a movie's been made. And he laughed and uh, said, okay. And I said, so let's just cut all the bullshit. And 
I'm going to leave you alone for a year while I try and find funding. And I'm going to come back and one day I'm going to show up at your gym and we're going to make this movie. Yep. And he laughed and said, okay. And a year, a year later, I showed up at his gym and we started shooting and wow. the, a couple of years later, there was a movie, but no, it was, he was always very reluctant yep. um, to this date. He says that he hasn't seen it. Yep. At least when I ask him, I think that's a load of shit personally, but <laughs> uh, I think he held off for a few months, yep. but uh, I think that eventually he did watch it. Yep. Um, he, if he, you know, he could have watched it night one, he will die telling me he's never seen it, never going to see it. And he'll say that proudly because that's who he is. Um, but yeah, he was always, uh, he eventually kind of, relented to the idea that the movie was really happening um but it was never something that was pushed forward by him it was always kind of dragging him along yep. um because in his mind like that's a very hollywood self-aggrandizing thing and mm. uh, while i think that louis likes attention um he doesn't like the idea of like seeking it I think he sees it as this like unworthy attention, yeah, 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 which I can totally relate to. He's a very simple, he comes across a very simple person. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, he's, he's exceptionally simple. He, yeah. uh, most of the problems he has with people stem from people expecting him to somehow be much more complex than he is. Yep. He, he, he pretty much tells you what he is and, what he's all about and more than you know it, it's it's not a hundred percent like open and honest but it's much more so than pretty much everybody else yeah you know he's he's very honest about what he is yeah that's unreal did he remember you from coming to visit that place as a 12 year old with your dad back in the day no he said that he did Yep. Um, and I said, bullshit, Louie, you don't remember me. And he kind of chuckled. And, uh, <laughs> he said, well, I remember that, you know, and he, he remembered my dad. Yep. He didn't remember my dad from visiting. He remembered my dad because my dad had, had called. Yeah. Like every, you know, basically monthly or, you know, every other month ever since then. So he knew that he had talked to my dad, you know, maybe a hundred times or more, but uh, he couldn't actually, he knew when we must have come, but he couldn't remember the actual meeting. That's unreal. What was the process like trying to talk to some of the, the other old members of Westside as you're going through the shooting of it all? Um, I had, I had a few people. So once I got Louis, Louis had his secretary at the time, again, forward me a lot of contacts. Yeah. And several of the people that I contacted, some of the first ones that Louis said, like, you can't do this unless you talk to so-and-so. Like, mm -hmm. you can't tell the story effectively. Yeah, you know. um, they were people that he had been, like, estranged from, some of them for, you know, 10, and, 10 or more years. Yeah, exactly. And so a couple of these people, they said, you know, like, hey, man, like, I'll do it, but you don't tell Louis because, you know, he'll, you know, he might murder you. And I was like, really because louis the one who gave me your number <laughs> and you know like they were because they had had beef and you know for the most part if you have an issue with louis uh it doesn't mean that louis has an issue with you yeah gotcha. like for louis it's usually like ah, i'm pissed off at you as an athlete that you're not achieving the way that i want yep. but they take it as like you know oh louis hates me as a person uh which is you know, basically never the case. It's usually like, you know, Louis, Louis expects to like fight and have rough relationships with people. Yeah. That was another thing that like, um, I like empathize with that. I understood that. Cause when you make a documentary about someone like there's a high chance that they're going to hate you at the end of it, oh, you know, they, they tend to love you while you're making it. And then it comes out and they feel really weird about like, well, what did I just do? Mm -hmm. Um, and with Louie, like people ask me all the time, like, are you friends with Louie and stuff? And I'm like, I'm fucking 34. 
<laughs> he's what you know he's in his 70s what you know what 74 year old or 75 year old do you know who just ha- keeps a bunch of early 30s friends like that's <laughs> i live you know i live on the other side of the country like our lives don't intersect if we see each other we're nice you know we talk but like the just the reality is like there's not a day that goes by where Louis thinks about like, you know, pick him up the phone and just having a conversation with me just to talk. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not his friend and that's okay. Yeah. Um, and a lot of, I think with a lot of his athletes, like they also didn't understand that, like he's your coach. Mm. And sometimes that means that he's going to be a real dick to you for mm. like most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, or maybe he's nice to you, but it doesn't mean that like he's going to invite you to come have dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I guess the other question we had is around the release, and, and again, mm-hmm. we talk about it more than happy to. Um, but there was a lot of issues with it getting out. Was something to do with funding, or what happened there? Yeah. So, so we did a Kickstarter, and what's the shortest way that I can put this? We did a Kickstarter and I say we, because at the time I had a partner, the partner was not someone that I had chosen. The partner was kind of assigned uh, by West side, the partner, uh, the partner had a lot of problems Mm. and uh, it turned out that he was not who his like, uh, he was not at all the person that he represented himself to be yeah. in terms of like, he was operating in the U S under like an assumed identity. Oh, wow. Faked his credentials, oh, uh, and had all sorts of legal issues. Oh, um, and so his life spiraled out of control around then. Yep. Um, I largely kept my distance from him. Um, because again, I hadn't known this guy beforehand. Yeah. He had been, you know, there were two people that I answered to. And one of those two people said, you got to work with this guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't think they understood what they were hmm. telling me that I had to work with. But the guy ended up just being a, you know, a criminal who got in trouble for, uh, running drugs across the country and guns and (laughs) short story is that he became a fugitive the fbi eventually came down on him um then he escaped the u.s marshals and to my knowledge he fled the country but before doing all that he stole all the money from our business account just before the movie came out so it left me holding the bill Yep. for you know holding all the bills in order to get the movie out wow. so i couldn't and on top of that i had to go to courts and get his name you know removed from everything Dang. and it it literally was he got arrested uh by the fbi two days before our first screening of the movie oh, so uh i got and it was west side who told me yeah. So I got a call in the middle of the night and then, you know, I'm down in Florida by then I'd moved from California to Florida and I'm frantically trying to finish the movie. And I get a call from somebody at West side saying like, Hey man, have you heard the news? And I was like, you know, what news, what happened? And immediately I thought like, did something happen to Lou? And, and they go, no, 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 it's not like that. They said it, this affects you. And I was, I was just like, what, what do you mean this affects me? And they were like, okay, so your, you know, partner. And I was just like, okay, what did he do? Like, he pissed somebody off or something? And they go, no, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but the FBI just arrested him. <laughs> and then I, you know, all of a sudden, not like, I pretty much blacked out. Like, I, I ended up, and this is as I was finishing the movie. So the last like six minutes of the movie, yep. um, I finished two days before, not even two days. I finished about uh, 36 hours before we screened the movie. Wow. Um, I literally like finished it. It 
somehow managed to export smoothly onto a hard drive. I told my girlfriend, who's now my wife, like, hey, I need you to watch this because I'm an emotional mess and I haven't slept in three days. If this doesn't make sense or if there's a, a file error or something, we're not going to the screening. I can't show my face ever. Like my career and film is done. Yeah. Um, but that night, basically uh, earlier in the night, he gets busted by the FBI. And then I was suddenly terrified that like, I'm going to fly up to Columbus. Yep. Cause he got arrested in Columbus. Oh shit. Uh, <laughs> he got to Columbus. Or actually, no, he got arrested on his way to Columbus, but he was being held like in Columbus. And the front page of the paper was all about him and this drug operation yep. that involved a bunch of crooked law enforcement. Yep. Um, so he was he was somehow he was facilitating it's all it the department of justice has a lot of public files that they've printed about this yeah wow um that must have been yeah, so frustrating for you you've got a movie on the movie yeah um i probably won't make that one <laughs> at least not for a long long time because uh it, it it's uh yeah there's like too much uh Surely. brings back too much anxiety oh, but uh imagine like you're in the process of trying to get to the screening you have to be pissed off at this point and in a state of shock like what was the next thing was, it, was there ever a thought in your head that oh you know what we're not going to show this movie it's all done or were you determined to get it through oh i was determined that i was going to try and get it through if the export of the movie worked but i told my girlfriend and i told my family like there's a serious chance that i'm going to land and get off the plane and FBI agents are going to immediately arrest me. Shit. So I, I just told them, I was like, so I feel really weird. <laughs> and on top of that, I have not slept really. Um, the movie theater, I had, and our contract with the movie theater, this screening was sold out. We had three sold out screenings in a row at the Arnold. That's cool. So um, the first night was supposed to go, was going to be the night where all the West side, you know, guys came back and stuff. And so I had 300 people, including about 80 West side members who were showing up yep. to a sold out screening. And in my contract with the theater, I was supposed to have delivered the movie Oops. two weeks earlier, <laughs> like, uh, you know, uploaded it through an FTP. Yep. As I said, I didn't finish editing the movie until the morning before, Fuck. exported it, hopped on a plane, went straight to Columbus, and then drove the hard drive over to the theater. Because for the two weeks, what I had been doing was I had the beginning of the movie. Yep. I, would, I had an, a dummy file export yep. that was roughly an hour and a half long, but the first 30 minutes was my movie. Yep. And then it was just an hour of black. Yep. So I was every night uploading that to the FTP after five o'clock so that no human could check it. Yep. They would just see that a file was uploading. Yep. And then I would wait like 30 or 40 minutes, go check the progress of it and go, okay, it looks like 30% of it is uploaded. And I would pull my modem out. Uh, ah. So that it would say it, the service had been, you know, the connection had been disconnected. Yep. And then the next day the theater would, call me or email me and say, hey, uh, your connection timed out. You know, we only got the first 30 minutes of your movie. Yep. <laughs> and I would go, oh man, you know, like I'll try it again today. Yeah, yeah. And finally they were like, hey, uh, your, your screenings are all sold out. So like, we don't want to have to refund people their money. Yep. But uh, you know, like the screening's a couple days away and we don't have your file. Yep. And so I convinced them that if I got there the day before, and I sprinted, you know, like sprinted out of the airport, got, you know, hopped in an Uber, ran up the steps and hand delivered them a hard drive yeah. that they would, they would screen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I, cause I don't know what's happening. Like, mm. you know, my internet's shaky or your internet, sh someone's internet shaky. And the reality was mm. the movie was not done. <laughs> 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 the best bit. And uh, like, you know, and my, 
my uh, soundtrack and composers and stuff, like they were, they put together a lot of that soundtrack in the last like week. Wow. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, then you add in like the FBI stuff and suddenly I'm having to get like in any free time I had, I'm talking to like criminal lawyers and stuff and Ooh. saying like, hey, so I don't know if this is a thing, but do I need to hire you? And what states are you, you know, qualified to practice law in? And yep. I ended up getting a lawyer who uh, surprisingly I liked. And uh, yeah, the guy, I was worried too that like his family would come to the screening. I had, I did have a couple screenings where people in Ohio, people came to our screenings because he like owed them money. Oh, uh, wow. Like all <laughs> just all over town and I went we had a screening at an MMA gym and someone out there said that he owed him money on the other side of the country um so it just kept being a thing some people from Brazil you know emailed me saying that he had like stolen stuff from them Black. and uh yeah it kept being a thing and then um man I'm as recently as like within the last year the U.S. Marshals reached out to me saying you know like do you know where he is and I was like I don't know, man. I ended up having to sue him and yep. like, holy fuck. I'd wow. help you all if I could, but I haven't seen or heard from the dude in a couple of years now. Man, fuck. that's, that's intense. But like, as we sit here, I mean, I'm really glad you pushed for it to come Absolutely. out and got it out. Like it was one of the greatest, uh, greatest document doco documentaries we've yeah. ever seen. And oh, I loved it. I was in the Kickstarter as soon as it, there was an opportunity to put some money in that thing. Um, I was, yeah, was man, it was a fucking awesome documentary. Somewhere. What you achieved with it is fucking insane, and we refer to it as our gospel. Absolutely. What was it like oh, that first screening in Ohio with some West Side guys there, and it being sold out, and then it's completely finished? That must have been a great feeling, right? Um, no the the whole time were like the whole first screening was absolutely miserable like i felt just physically sick the entire time because yep. that was also i had not watched oh fuck i hadn't watched it start to finish because i didn't have time the last few days yep. so i was watching like a couple minutes at a time which is not how you you know like mm. it was an, it was at that point an hour and like 58 minutes or something the final version is like an hour and 30 Four, something like that um but when you put together a documentary like it's really hard to keep the framework and the store the story structure like going and it's really hard to get like the whole flow right um and one of the key components is you have to watch it front to back to figure out like, where is it slowing down? Where are we losing people? What, what parts need to, you know, be brought up or down? What parts ultimately need to be taken out? Yep. And it's really hard as you're, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of cuts and little pieces. So when you're putting it together in this like very modular manner, you know, it's like, it's like building a whole car and never once putting the key in the ignition and turning it over. Oh and then you sell it and the customer is going to do that now. And you're like, oh shit, I hope I didn't, <laughs> Fuck. I hope I didn't fuck something up along the way. Like, I hope that that thing works. Um, so the whole time I was just like, I'm watching it with people who are in it. Yeah. And, the, you know, like, there's some scary people. Yeah. So, to go back to my, to my height and weight and stuff, I don't know if you can tell because I have an enormous head. Yep. But I'm 280 pounds right now. Yeah. That's awesome. So you got that. Like, yeah. So I got there. I also eventually, like, uh, I've squatted 670 in briefs. I've squatted 545 to a 14-inch box raw. Yep. Um, I've benched 425 with a pause. I just the other day hit 315 for 11 reps for the kids. Felt like I could have maybe gone 14 or 15. My best is 17. Yeah. Uh, so I got to a point where I was like, I'm, I'm kind of strong now. Yeah. 
Um, but still being around, I mean, like Dave Hoff was in the audience. If I, you know, like if I pissed him off, you know, like he put me through a wall. So, and, you know, like, and, and guys like, you know, Jerry O and uh, Don Dameron were there and, you know, like really, you know, like Intimidating. The, the straight up like gangsters of like the late eighties and early nineties West side, when it was like the scariest, yeah. they were all there. So I was like, man, if, if they're unhappy and I'm just sitting there the whole time, like I'm in the middle of the audience. I'm like, if any one of these guys wants to kill me, I'm not making it out of here. <laughs> and then the lights come up yeah. and the like theater owner comes or the theater manager, somebody from the theater comes out with a microphone <laughs> and they're like, you know, oh, let's give it up for Michael Fahey and West Side versus the world. And the whole place is dead silent. Oh. And I walk up to the front and there's a microphone sitting there. And I'm looking up at 300, you know, just all yoked up power lifters and everyone is dead silent well, and i just said like yo if y'all hated it like i can just walk out now and then uh bob co stood up from the back and said something like you know i, I think he yelled something like you know michael fay who's a fucking legend or something yeah <laughs> and then he started like clapping and, and everyone started clapping but it was it was the weirdest <laughs> dead silence and just stone faces oh. all over and i was like all right this is where they kill me this, this is, is where i die now <laughs> this is where i die um my family said like they were afraid for me because they're like we didn't know what that energy was like we haven't that that wasn't normal that that's not that's not right but it turned out that at a lot of our early screenings had that vibe yeah right um and I ended up tweaking some things along the way yep. that I noticed this is like, cause we ended up doing a big, you know, like 30 city tour with it and stuff where we just went to gyms. Mm. Um, I'd show up in a Hyundai accent with my girlfriend and we'd roll out speakers and we'd throw up a projector and a screen. And we literally just screened it on a, you know, as a road show in nothing but like mostly hardcore powerlifting gyms all around the country. And every time we went back to the hotel room, I would be making little tiny tweaks and stuff, trying to, trying to get it just right. And the version that's, you know, now out there is that kind of shortened down version. I, I took out a ton of stuff. All of my movies are really dense. Yep. Um, like I don't leave a ton of just space. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so even though it's it's rather short, uh, it's got just a ton of verbiage and a ton of dialogue in it. Um, but I eventually got it to a point where it ends and people go into like actual applause. And I was like, okay, that's that's more sort of the note I wanted to end on. It it was ending originally at like a very sort of like dark looming existential like crisis <laughs> that just overwhelmed people wow. and uh while that was really cool after that happened like the sixth time i was like that's not quite right <laughs> like i i've done something done something further back yeah. um but yeah it just landed especially in the early screenings because there was so many like former west side people there that it ended with such like a heavy emotional tone yeah, of course. um and especially like getting into like we don't outright say it but just like kind of posing the question of like you know what's gonna happen after louis yeah, yeah right and it's like for them you know like for so many of them like he's he hates being referred to as a father figure but he's a father figure for so many of them yeah. and that's like a a very sort of you know it's an obvious thing that like every story has to deal with is like what you know ultimately what will happen to this person yeah. and especially when they're already like sort of of an advanced age not to say that he's like on his deathbed but all of these people whose lives he touched presumably you know the vast majority of them will outlive him yeah you know and 
suddenly for a lot of them, it like forced them to have to consider that. And that was like, if you wanted to make these guys, you know, cry, like that was, that was the way to do it was just to very innocuously pose the question of like, what happens after Louis? Yeah, that's a good question. One, one that I think a lot of people were left scratching their head after that. Man, it's a fucking mm-hmm. great documentary. And like to hear the story of what you've had to go through and with all that fucking FBI, US Marshal shit, like, man, cre- <laughs> all the credit to you. Unreal. I know I'm going to watch West Side First of World tonight. Yeah, I was watching thinking about the, watching it over lunch, to be honest. For the seven. I, I also had my own screenings where I just made my other friends um, who did or didn't know about it already watch it with me several times. Uh-huh. <laughs> in this actual, in this, in the podcast. <laughs> I watched it in this room. I got a projector screen as well <laughs> very very and i instruct my clients if they wish to pal if they it is not uh um an option it's actually a requirement for them to mm-hmm. do that now <laughs> it used to be powerlifting unlimited when that was the one running around on youtube so yeah they have to watch that um i haven't got to the point where i sit them down and ask them questions about it but that is probably the next stage because i did do that with powerlifting unlimited they had to do a 10 question you did that to me yes exactly <laughs> uh, um, so we could find out to make sure they truly watched it <laughs> yeah i haven't i haven't watched it since i haven't watched it um like i never watched it on netflix i've never watched it on amazon i've never watched it on dvd or blu-ray um when we did our road show i would generally go sit in the car while it screened Mm. i like i i hate watching it because the whole time just as like the creator of anything um especially because like documentaries take so long to do the average documentary takes four years before you get to the point where you're trying to distribute it. Um, And like the whole time, all you're thinking is like, man, I learned all these things. And now you're watching what you did at different points in the documentary, you're watching what you did years earlier. And so like the whole time, all I can think about is like, what would I do different now? Yeah. It's very hard to like enjoy any of it. Yeah. I'm glad that other people can, but for me, there's there's very few things that I enjoy about watching anything that I work on. Well, sir, I can tell you, we love it. We think it's incredible. We thank you for persevering and creating it and seeing it through. It's unreal. Uh, and hopefully one day when this COVID craziness locks down, we'll not even try and get an opportunity to head over that way if we're lucky enough to train in that place. Like yeah. The pilgrimage of a power lifter, that's something you should try and do. <laughs> At some point in time, it is a, it is a religious <laughs> conquest. But bro, we got um, we got ten questions for you to finish you off. All right, they are rapid fire. The first thing that comes in your head, um, they can be silly and serious. I hope you're ready for this. What word Sick. comes next? Apple, banana, house, or ape? What word comes next? Yes. And so those were, that wasn't a sequence. That was, those were my choices. No, apple, banana, house, ape. The following word will be? Uh, monkey. Monkey, yeah. <laughs> That's what, a good one. What motivates you to work hard? What other option is there? Fuck, I love that. Who was your hero? Uh, my mom, I think. If... You have the opportunity to go to karaoke night. What song are you going to sing? What's your go-to? Um, Cake the Distance, because everything they sing is pretty monotone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was your nickname as a kid? Uh, I had two. Uh, when I played football, it was Boris, because I wouldn't stop talking about Soviet training systems. <laughs> and... Uh, other than that, I had the nickname Faba, which just comes from a friend who was high who couldn't figure out how to say my last name. <laughs> now, this is, this is an important one. How many pillows do you sleep with, Michael? Uh, I generally go three. Three sleep. Three? Where three? Yeah. Three? Yeah, so can you explain? Where are we putting these three? Yeah, where are, we, where are they go? Um, I have a giant head, and I'm, I'm pretty heavy. Mm. Uh, so... 
two will will generally go under my head one sort of directly under one will kind of bridge at an angle forward the third will be one of those long pillows that will be you know on the side yep. my knee will usually end up on that one that's, yeah, a, like that's that. a good system i like it how long does it take you to get ready in the morning it can take me as little as about six minutes to take a shower and get dressed generally doesn't Being a i'm going to take time if i have it it wouldn't take long who was your first crush as a kid my first crush um like if we're not talking celebrities we're talking actual people yeah we can go both the um first celebrity would probably be uh like cindy crawford yeah. actual person uh at least whose name i can remember would be this girl alicia ferris Ooh. alicia ferris that's a weird question we asked that one i like that one though yeah. who knows you best uh my wife and now the genie is going to grant you three wishes wishes you've rubbed the bottle the genie has popped out of the bottle what are your three wishes Ooh. Man, I'm going to wish, obviously one has to be that I can give myself a haircut. <laughs> that would just solve a lot. Um, the other is going to be that I can create things at the same speed that I can think of them. Ooh, good wish. And yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm super envious, like whenever I see a video of like a musician doing like the looping thing yeah, where they'll like have a keyboard and they'll start looping in instruments and like in real time, just create a song. Um, I would love like the ability to just think of something and moments later have it be real rather than uh, fuck up a whole bunch on the computer. Um, and then third one, I don't know, flight. Yeah, yeah, good one. That's cool. always a good one. Flying's cool. You get real high, it's scary. Yeah. I will say in looking at things, this is something completely random. Um, I always get irritated when I watch, say, like a a comic book movie and someone has like super speed and or super strength mm. but they don't have both mm. Mm. because obviously if you have one you have to have the other yeah i get you hey, you Just, can't it super fast but yeah he, that's a really good point yeah the hulk has got to be fast he might get tired but he's got to be fast likewise Quicksilver or the Flash or whatever, those dudes have to be really damn strong. Yeah, we have to that fast. That's yeah. I'm tired of comic books breaking the laws of physics, <laughs> and specifically only the laws of physics as they relate to strength. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's all just forced production. If they can just fix that, I have no other problems with any of it. <laughs> Mate, we can't uh, we can't thank you enough for giving up. I assume your Thursday night over there to, to talk to us. Um, we really appreciate it. Really appreciate you telling your story. And as Johnny said, hopefully when all this is over, we can uh, head over that way and do a podcast tour and catch up in person. Um, but for those wanting to reach out, get in touch with you, know more, how can they find you? Uh, the best way is through Instagram. I'm on there the most at Westside Film. Yep. Um, if you're interested in sport training or particularly training you know younger and high school athletes for things like track and field um or football or basketball or anything like that at leon strength those are the two places that i'm most likely to respond to you and if you ask me a question i'll probably leave you like five minutes of voice notes <laughs> perfect Mate, we'll again i talk <laughs> <laughs> mate we'll chuck all those links up in the show notes again thank you so much for your time and hopefully we'll catch up soon brother thanks bro all right that. thank you thank you see you bro have a good night